I was on American Idol this past season. I did, um, a, well, <laughs> I told them straight up, in order for me to be my most optimal self, I'll need some of these accommodations. I was the only non-minor there who had his mom with him during that time. And I'm proud to admit that. I'm a mama's boy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gen, and I explore issues through both sides. And I'll be moderating this middle ground episode of autistic and neurotypical. And the first prompt is, I find the word disabled offensive. Can the agreeers please step forward? I think you should go back there. Okay. Well, I guess I'll start off first. Um, so being on the spectrum, the autism sector myself, and being someone who masks my autism pretty well, I have a hard time accepting the fact that technically, yes, I am disabled because throughout my entire life, I've had to deal with things like sensory overload, you know, dealing with high emotions at times and stuff like that. But I also was raised to be a go-getter and to, if I put my mind to anything, I can accomplish my goals. And so, and I have accomplished stuff. I'm a writer. I've written about being on the spectrum for Insider, The Doe, and places like that. And I don't let my disability stop me. So it's like, you know, we live in this world where having a disability is a bad thing and I and most people kind of operate that way and like view disabled people in a negative light. And so for me, whenever someone calls me disabled, it's definitely a trigger for me, to be honest. Yeah, I would agree with exactly what you're saying. That was kind of why the reason I came up as well. Um, I feel that as a root, it's not an offensive word, but the stigma that our society has made it today has created it to be an offensive word. My, my son is nonverbal. He's never said a word, never had anything. Um, use communication with his uh, language. What I find the problem with disabled uh, that I've always had an issue with is it looks at my son in a way where he's supposed to be fitting into everyone else's world. Even movies that are made about autism that are supposed to be like these movies that are make everybody love autism, usually at the end of the movie they do something in everyone else's world that makes them special. Like they catch a touchdown, they, they go to prom. My son's not gonna catch a touchdown. My son's not gonna go to prom. He doesn't care about those things. And sometimes you can just be who you are, and you don't have to be labeled, well, you don't do these things, so you're disabled. Can the disagreeers please step forward, please? I never read too deeply into the word disabled. It's just a descriptor of me. I'm disabled. No one's really used disabled as an insult to me, at least not in any way that I've been able to pick up on it. However, people have used the R word to me, and that is what is offensive to me. Uh, disabled is just a descriptor. At the same time though, I feel like this is a real test for the gray area here because I still somehow agree with what every single one of you just said, even though I disagree with the prompt. But everybody has their own relationship with words and terminology, and I think that that's what's so beautiful about the autism community. I uh, find myself agreeing with what James is saying, where you know his son probably shouldn't have to conform to the ideas that the world is uh, setting in place. Like, maybe he's perfectly happy uh, being nonverbal and he shouldn't be expected to talk. Um, but at the same time, if we try and say, you know, disabilities don't exist and that everyone has to fit in this box, right, and we get rid of the term altogether, then that's kind of maybe forcing people like James's son to uh, conform to the world. Just to piggyback off of that, say, James, uh, have you told your son about this episode and has your son ever com uh, communicated uh, any degree of advocacy to you at all? I talk to him about everything. People always tell me when they find out he's nonverbal, they're like, you should talk to him. I'm like, I talk to him more than I talk to anybody else on earth. Like, it's constant. There's things he doesn't understand, like fundamental things that he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that I'm going to do this. He doesn't understand what autism is. He doesn't understand things like that. But I tell him, I'm like, we're going to go, we're going to talk about you. We're going to have, you know, all the great things about you. When I relate to my son, what I try to do is I try to put myself in his shoes. So I write a blog about him. I try to do autism appreciation, I call it, where I talk about the positives of autism and how he's a great kid, not despite autism, but in many ways because of autism. That makes me very happy to hear. I'd love to read your blog. Thank you, okay. Jubilee viewers, you should read his blog. I'm <laughs> 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 my new hype man. man, thank you. So, back to the prompt. Just like what you have said, I f was one of the few people that f faced the R word, especially in high school. I haven't been called disabled for, for any reason to be d offensive for me anyways, but I do see like how it can be debatable and questionable because it can come off as like 
you're trying to say this person can't do something just because they can't think a accordingly or maybe cannot walk accordingly or can't concentrate accordingly. Do you identify or view yourself as disabled? Y yes, but I don't, I don't personally find it offensive for me because I feel like there's just uglier words, but I do respect where everyone else is coming from though. What do you think of that word disabled? Does it bother you? Disabled, um, for me, the kind of autism I have is, uh, communication disorder, like for example, when I was a little girl, I walked around in circles talking to myself. I wanted to join the conversation, but I didn't know how, and my brain wouldn't do what I was telling it to do, and I've had 20 years of speech therapy, 15 years of occupational therapy, to be able to talk like everyone else to get where I am today. So you think it's okay to use the word disability because it helps people understand mm -hmm. how hard you've worked mm -hmm. to be in the conversation. Yes, it does. And I'm even in the therapy right now. That's true. And I would agree with Abby on that. I would say that because this um, autism word and spectrum now has successful people and writers yeah. who are neurodifferent, Mm -hmm. and people who have had 20, to, 20 years of speech therapy. And I'm one of them. And you are, <laughs> and, and rock star over here. <laughs> but, but it's confusing. So I, I like the word disability because when we're in public and Abby has a stim or arms are flailing, you know. Yeah, and some people on the spectrum tend to rock back and forth and flop their hands. And that's a stim. Oh, why are you going to call me that stem. out? I was doing that just now. <laughs> no, literally, I've been holding my hands like but, this. But that's, this time. Yeah, I do that's that's a good thing. Though. I that's even do this, or I, um, but I don't rock back and forth. Right, but that's not your stim, but other people do like that. So, <laughs> But whatever mine. that thing is, I just feel like if you understand that autism can be different, can be a disability, because I don't have to stem, I can STEM. This is a STEM too. Mm -hmm. and uh, but it's stems. not imperative for me to do that to be in this conversation right now. I do have a question though, because the R word kind of came up amongst a few of few of you guys. Mm -hmm. Is there any nuance with that in that being not offensive or offensive? No. <laughs> Just straight up, no. Because the thing is, we've come such a long way in terms of like, well, I don't know if a long way in terms of understanding autism, I think that's why we're all here, but, <laughs> but um, just more like, like, we've gone past that word. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was, I used to work at a coffee shop and there was this guy who would never call people that word, but he just would say like, oh, that's the, the R word. Like that's that, like whatever. He was kind of like one of those people that was kind of like, well, it's just a word and it's just a word. Yeah. I'm like, well, there are several other English words <laughs> to yeah. use. So it's just like, I don't really see the, like the medical field has gotten past it. Mm -hmm. We should get yeah. past it. The year, so it's the year is not 1940. Right. And at this point in today's modern language, it is really an insult. Um, especially going to a public high school, I hear that a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have trouble making friends. Can the Greers step up? I get emotional thinking about this. Um, I still am struggling, especially now. Um, it just feels like everyone is, you know, I'd never had any friends until third grade. I only talked about Pokemon with him and that was it. And he was probably likely also on the spectrum. And I was so severely bullied at my public elementary school. Girls tended to be nicer to me. Uh, as opposed to boys. Um, I see eye to eye. Yeah, I have a lot of trauma that I'm working through um, regarding bullying in that way. I find it harder to talk to men even today for that reason. I, I, I'm lonely. I'm, I'm so lonely. <laughs> I, I really, I, I channel all of it into my music. I channel every aspect of my loneliness and trying to understand other people and trying to connect with other people in my music and my songwriting. Uh, it is my coping mechanism and uh, I just try and keep myself busy uh, to uh, cope with the fact that I've really, really struggled to make friends. Um, when I was a little girl, life was very, very hard. I didn't have any friends. I couldn't, I wanted to join the conversation, but I couldn't because my brain wouldn't do what I was telling it to do. And for, in high school, I sat alone at lunch and I had, didn't really have any friends. 
until I didn't start making friends till I was like 17 or 18. Same here. Somewhere around Same there. Here. And truly. Because I've all that's why I've always wanted to be an adult because I knew I'd have more language, it'll be easy for me to communicate and life would be life in general would would have been easier. I actually can relate with Aiden to an extent. I I had a difficult time making friends because well at the time, when I was younger, of course, I didn't know I had autism, but I was also a little bit different. I was those autistic kids who kind of was a social butterfly at the time, so believe it or not, aside from how I appear, I was such an extrovert. I was being seen in middle school as kind of like a class clown, and then by like high school, the first high school I went to, which was a really bad school, I was put the little the gay stigma because of my voice, because all the guys there, their voices are more like, low like this. <laughs> but mine, but at the time I was like, more high like this. But it was hard and by the other high school, which I spent the rest of my high school years, I made a little bitty friends, but people who actually did not just disregard me and did not see me as like a walking joke or some potential lost cause, because a lot of them was really enough afraid of me of what I can do, so. Well, I would like to chime in in case it were to, uh, okay, never mind. In a, in a sec. Um, yeah, well now I don't remember. <laughs> uh, well, no, I do. Um, I have friends, I do have friends, but I only have friends one at a time. Mm. I have never in my life ever truly been a part of a friend group and and I have some of the most beautiful friendships ever and they're so quality because it's just me and that one friend but man I just I just wish I could be a part of a group I was out in public recently I saw four artsy looking people that were about my age and they were all talking and having a blast and I was just looking at them just like when the jealousy gonna, when, kicks in <laughs> yeah when, when am I gonna have that that's what I wanted to add you can move sure. on now Mm -hmm. It's funny because I disagreed. I was the only one on my side who disagreed, but I also can pinpoint each and like each of you in something that you said because I definitely can relate. I think I've gotten good at developing surface level friendships. As an adult, I still don't really know how to find that line between like opening myself up, but also not expecting the same in return from the other person because sometimes they don't know how to give the same in return. So it's just, it, like it's not just necessarily like that the other person has bad intentions, it's just the way we communicate and the way that we think can be different and just not always work. And I think that's still something I'm struggling with. Even here, like hearing you guys over there when I was disagreeing, the level of openness that you're willing to share these stories is like, it's what we always say we want. Like as a parent, you go, I want to have a, I want to have a kid who's, who's, you know, uh, honest and who doesn't lie and who doesn't do these things. And then I'm like, he has autism. Like, oh, I'm like, no, but that's exactly what we all want, right? We want that, <laughs> that thing. And they don't get it. And I've, I've struggled with my son. My son is not. I mean, social was always, in my opinion, like out the window for him. He's not very, like, he doesn't want to socialize, hang out with people. But what ended up happening was my girlfriend's son is minimally verbal, and he's known him since he was like three years old. And whenever we would get together, he would always like try to play with my son and, and Lucas was just kind of like, whatever. And we noticed about a year ago, they were in the pool and like Lucas started like following him around the pool, trying to like tag him. I was like, oh my God, is this happening? And we've noticed slowly that he's been doing that too. I see that, I, I worried about him having, you know, people be his friend. I worry about people taking advantage of him. I worry about neurotypical people sometimes having the worst in <laughs> intentions. These people who, who don't have disabilities are the ones who sometimes do some of the cruelest and worst things. So it's always been, I'm not so worried about him and friends, I'm worried about the other people around him to be his friends sometimes a little more. As far as developing friendships, it's ironic because I'm insanely social. Like I traveled Europe by myself with a backpack and I'm still friendly with people I met for a week on a train in wow. Venice. When Abby was, um, as she told you, a little kid, she almost didn't see them. It's it like all, I didn't see them. It was like other kids, she just walked right past them. She was so in her own world, which is her kind of autism. And so, can I explain the whole Ariel story? 
Um, you can. Sure. And not? when I was a really little kid, when I first saw the movie we, Walt Disney's The Little Mermaid, I really understood Ariel, and she she inspired me. She, Ariel was my inspiration because it's just like how where she wanted to be with the humans, and I wanted to be with the neurotypical people, just like that. And when Ariel became human, she couldn't talk. That's how I felt. Mm. That's exactly the kind of autism I have too, Abby. <gasps> really? Yeah, except I never verbalized it like you did. I have looked out on someone for being autistic. I'll sit next to you, why not? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I have. I mean, I'm not proud of it because I was diagnosed around three or four years old and my parents got me intervention very early. Because of that, I was able to get coping skills and learn how to mask and learn how to essentially be like everyone else. I'm at a weird point, like the last couple of years, I've really have come to realize that like the mask I've had to put on has really been kind of like cemented onto my face. <laughs> and like my autistic self is like something I'm still trying to chip away at. Like when I was younger, like I was never the one to bully anyone, but like I would take note of like other kids who I felt like were autistic, like whether they stemmed noticeably or not. And I kind of subconsciously would just sort of be like, well, I can mask. Why can't you keep it together for, for lack of a better way of saying it? And I'm certainly not proud of it. And it's something that I definitely am working towards correcting about myself. But for me to say that I haven't done that would be a lie, which is why I'm, <laughs> which is why I'm sitting here. I never really spoke or never looked down on those on the spectrum. And this was obviously before I found out I was autistic because I was diagnosed at two. And then I later found out by like, I think middle school year. But I never looked down on them because in the end of the day, for me anyways, they're human and let alone, aside from me being autistic, I'm also can be looked down because I'm, as you all see, I'm alternative and stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> there's just no point for me anyways to look down on someone that's on a spectrum or anyone who is, who's with special needs or has any other disabilities that they may not have asked for anyways. From the information I've gathered, the four of us who are on the spectrum were all diagnosed very early. Mm -hmm. I would be very, very curious to know uh, somebody somebody who was diagnosed much later's perspective on that, especially since for so many of these later diagnosed people, they don't realize they're on the spectrum immediately. I've sat at parties with Asperger kids, which I know you're not supposed to say that word, but the intelligence in an Asperger person is such a gift. Uh, uh, and um, I learned all about astronomy from this one kid in two hours, and his mother nice. was saying, oh, leave, her, leave the nice lady alone. And I was like, no, please let him stay with me. This is so cool. So because, that's because I'm coming from that place of looking at neurodiversity, autism, Asperger's in, in a different way because I've been around it for 25 years. I'm a teacher's aide for the beginning theater class at my school. And there are a few, quite a few kids in the class with autism. Sometimes they'll say something that's a little crazy or a little out there. Sometimes like some other kid might take offense to it, but I just know like sometimes there's no filter, like it's okay. And I'm just like, okay, like let's talk about why that might not work, why that not might not be a thing to say. Or if it's something that's like, whatever, we can just move past it, so. Yeah, definitely like no judgment at all. Like I understand that sometimes uh, there's like less of a filter or something else like that. So both of my parents are special education preschool teachers. Um, they've bounced around throughout the grade levels. But when I was in preschool, I went to the same campus that they did. And I was in a class where myself and then later my sister were the only two neurotypical kids. Mm -hmm. um, everyone else there either had autism, Asperger's, or some sort of physical disability. Mm -hmm. It's not something where I would look down on a person for having that just because I've been around it so long. But I know that, um, like we were talking about, public high schools mm -hmm. and kids in general can be really cruel. And it's not uncommon to see uh, autism or the R word being thrown around as an insult. And yes. it, it happens on social media all the time, especially TikTok. Unfortunately. TikTok is like a war ground, a battleground for like the rudest, meanest, most judgmental people. And sadly, a percentage of them say they are on the spectrum. Prior to my son being diagnosed, I remember one of the things that worried me was that as a parent, when you first have a baby, 
autism is almost treated like something you have to avoid. Like it was, it's almost like, be careful, don't, like, don't feed him this, don't do this, don't tell him that. <laughs> and then when he had autism, I was like, okay, now what? And they're all like, and I'm like, but what, is, what does it mean? Nobody could tell me what it meant, nobody told me what it looked like. I'm like, he smiles, he hugs me. They're like, some people hug. Is well, he gonna talk? Maybe. I'm like, you're not gonna tell me anything. What am I gonna find out about him? So I was preconditioned to be fearful of this thing that once I saw how it affected our lives personally, it wasn't bad, you know? It was one of those things where like, I was expecting the worst possible situation. I think a lot of times people have opinions on something that they don't know anything about. What I actually just realized is one of the key defining moments was actually like remembering. I was having a hard time socializing in middle school. I remember, I remember Sacred. one commercial <laughs> yeah, me too. from Autism Speaks. It was like, the Black Plague was among us and just talking about an autism. It's like autism was basically treated like this curse <laughs> and you know it's gonna creep on you when you're least expecting it and everything like and I remember that commercial vividly and it's just like what kind of message are you sending out to the whole world who does who won't take the time to educate themselves yeah. on things and I'm I think so happy that Autism Speaks has really stepped up their game in recent years since then. It's harder for autistic people to get a job. Join our middle ground Patreon to watch this exclusive prompt. Accommodations should be made for autistic people to be included in society. Something that I've written about quite a bit and why I felt like I've had to write about my autistic experiences a lot as an adult is because there are no services really for adults. <laughs> and I, that's a problem, at least like besides like ther speech therapies and stuff like that. I mean, in terms of like for me, learning how to be social, it was something I had to learn on my own. And like, I know that other autistic people, unfortunately, will struggle with substance abuse and mm -hmm. alcoholism and stuff like that because, you know, putting on the mask can be so exhausting. <laughs> you just kind of like don't know what else to do. Taking THC for me has helped really kind of learn, helped me learn how to, about my autism actually, which is, sounds like such a stoner thing. I don't consider myself a stoner, but just, <laughs> you know, I don't think those are concrete things like you know and i i do think that the medical industry in part by updating their understanding and updating terminology i do think that there needs to be more what are some specific accommodations you would like to see i don't know if i can think of specific accommodations but i think just again just like this overall misunderstanding of autism really as cliche as it is i mean it really just affects every a single autistic person. Well, the problem is that autism manifests itself in so many unique ways right. and yes, it can yeah. differ so much from person to person right. that, you know, the moment that you're out of the public school system, right, uh, mm -hmm. they stop providing an aid, right? And yeah. Exactly. Yeah, navigating life yourself like that is probably really difficult. Um, it's difficult for a typical person coming out of high school in this day and age with the pressures and social media in your face. I see it with her brother. It is so hard, I think, for a lot of people, let alone someone. And then the parents of the person who just turned 18 trying to help their kid build a life. Yeah, with no support. No support. It's, it takes a lot of fight. I'm a fighter, so I speak from that. I've been there, done that. I have cried more hours on the phone trying to get accommodations and programs going for her after 18 than I did when she was a, a younger kid. Not to mention colleges are one of the few places that has a piss poor reputation. I'm not saying all universities and colleges, but most of them has a piss poor reputation for not having appropriate accommodations, but not just for, for, for kids on spectrum, but I mean, other kids, whether they're neurotypical, but they are have special oh, education. Absolutely. It could be overstimulating. Yeah, they can sure. be overstimulating because when you're out of high school and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, especially college, and, and you try to get your IEP, it, I mean, sorry, IEP, <laughs> it feels like you're going under because I'm trying so hard to scream, I need assistance, but it's like they still won't hear me. I'm in a new college, I'm going to be attending that one soon, but the other one that I finished my AA in, they made a a big reputation for not taking appropriate matters when dealing with people with IEPs or that really does need help, even if they're not on the spectrum. Well, congrats let's, on your AA. Let's hear from the you. disagree. All right, just to be clear, I do not disagree with any of you. <laughs> 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 but I do disagree with the prompt because obviously people on the spectrum need accommodations. I had an IEP growing up. Yes, I feel I like I often mm -hmm. need 
accommodations all the time. But I really am hopeful that we can get to a point where we won't uh, need accommodations to be included in society. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I mm -hmm. like we should like for example, Best Buddies, an organization. They they say it firsthand. They exist to not exist. Mm -hmm. They're doing these amazing services for including disabled people, but ultimately the goal is for that to not happen. Mm -hmm. I always try to be respectful of everybody else. Like if we are at a loud restaurant and he's yelling at a loud restaurant, everyone's yelling. You can yell at a loud restaurant. But if we're at a library, if we're at a recital or something, I take him outside. So because of that, there's things we can't do. But in the last few years, we've been going to, like on Broadway, they'll have autism friendly presentations. We saw the Rockettes, we saw the Nutcracker. And it was so great to not only be able to do that with him and let him be able to see that and be a part of it and to not stand out, but on top of it too, people who are affected by autism differently than my son, to see them given like, you know, fidget toys and these squeeze, I'm like, this is such a, a beautiful thing. And I think sometimes when we talk about accommodations, a lot of people who are neurotypical see it as, okay, what are you gonna do to my thing now to make it easier for somebody else? And what I'm saying is, you don't necessarily have to change what you're doing, but maybe make something that my son can go to as well, where if he's not gonna interfere with what you're doing, that kind of a thing. That's how I saw it when I, when I sat down for it. Just because you were talking about Broadway shows, I know the show How to Dance in Ohio, which is <laughs> I about- I just saw it. I love uh, how, I I really saw wanna, how to Dance in Ohio. I really wanna go York. see it. It was great. Um, but I think, if I remember correctly, I think they do have like a sensory room. They, they do, they have mm -hmm. a sensory yeah. room. They, they have, have everything. Spinners, so they have all kinds of stuff that's uh, accommodated, and the performers are on the spectrum. So. Right, and so like with that, I think we can normalize things like that. I was on American Idol this past season. I did, um, a, well, <laughs> 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 and I, I told them straight up, um, in order for me to be my most optimal self, in or, and in order for me to be my best self, I'll need some of these accommodations. I'll need you, I understand that you know, schedules are a bit loose when it comes to, you know, entertainment industry related stuff. But if you can just give me some degree of a little push, you know, as to giving me some sort of ETA for this, that, and the other, and they were great. They were great. I had a wonderful experience on American Idol for that reason. I was the only non-minor there who had his mom with him during that time. Um, and I'm proud to admit that. I'm a mama's boy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Autistic people are not accurately represented in the media. Let's go, people. <sighs> I have so many thoughts about so this. <laughs> it's okay. Obviously, I'm a white autistic male, and a lot of like the mainstream representation are quote unquote like super intelligent white autistic males. But that's all there really is. And for me, I'm not like Sean on the good doctor. I think we've definitely made some good progress with certain things, but I just remember growing up it was always like superficial stereotype. And I just would love to see autism represented in a way that's more nuanced with like, particularly with women, like not all autistic women are Temple Grandin. <laughs> and oh, as brilliant her. as she is, as brilliant as she is, but that's not, that the problem is they wanna take these like pillars and just kind of think that like, these are the only options. It's either like the worst of the worst or the best of the best and that's not, fair and no, it's not true. No, that's so true. You know, I want to see an autistic character where their autism isn't necessarily like their whole story. I have some friends who think that, and I think this is probably kind of prevalent, if you say they have autism, they're either, they have savant syndrome, right? Where they're just a genius and they can magically uh, do something perfectly, like play piano. Um, yes. Or they're a person who has really low functioning autism and you know, they can't do much, you know, they need able people to help them. It's unfortunate that that's kind of the two stories that are being pushed, um, and there's not a lot of nuance there. And people assume uh, the worst or the best, and they don't look at it the other way. So my thing is I wish that this, the term spectrum keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, what it doesn't do is honor the individual skill sets. Right. Like you have an incredible skill set. You just got your AA. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and and your son sounds amazing and loving and sweet, and you know what that is because you spend all your time with him. And and this charm right here is amazing. <laughs> but but what bothers me the most mm -hmm. is that in the media, like TikTok, for example, I guess oh it's God. trending to be autistic, oh, and I'm very worried be, about this. Yeah. It's trending. Imagine what Thomas. Well, what I'd like to say is, if you have sensory issues, 
you're now called autistic. I grew up with a brother who had sensory issues. He is not autistic. But now you're clumped in with that. Mm -hmm. So then what is the representation if there's literally not three levels, but 50 levels yeah. of functioning. 50 levels of it's, functioning? Yeah, it's, it's confusing. Right, like, like on it, TikTok, you'll see like someone with 8 million followers on TikTok who's in a comedian who's the funniest person ever and who I'm an amazing fan of is, is looking for an autism diagnosis at 35 with a college degree and two kids. And you go, oh, I wonder what that is for them because did you have any speech therapy? What is it and why do you feel you need that diagnosis? But that media attention is what's, is what's permeating the rest of people who are not familiar with autism thinking, oh, I, have, I don't like loud noises. I hate the sun. I must too be autistic. And that's a, wor that's a worry for me. I'm, I'm curious. Do you think that media representation, could you see it like in a positive light in the sense that now people are wanting to identify with it because they've seen the positive traits of autism. I, I don't, there's something positive going on with it being, I use the word trendy, but I will tell you, if I didn't have people that attack me on social media for helping Abby to get her, what do we say, what's our sentence, to get your brain? To do what I'm telling it to do, of course. Right, to get her brain to do what she's I telling like it to do. I haters. I know, but there's some really mean people and it's because I'm helping the her. The haters are ugly and the haters are extremely overweight. <laughs> That's so, quite an insult. Oh, yeah. Now, why don't you tell them why is that? You said that because you're thinking in categories. Because I think in categories, this is the way my mind works and I wrote a song about it. Right, so that's, but that is part of what we're dealing with to be in the conversation right here, right now. In media, there's the gender stereotypes, there's the racial stereotypes, and people are saying, oh, we need to fight the stereotypes, but everyone's okay with the stereotypes about autism happening. And there obviously is a small group of people <laughs> trying to fight those, but there's not as big of a realm of, oh, we need to fight the racial stereotypes, we need to fight the gender stereotypes as there is for the rest. Okay, once again, <laughs> I totally agree with everybody. Um, but the reason why I stayed back is because I can't lie here. I really do feel like I have been represented quite well. But I think the reason for that is you I are am the, the representation. I am the stereotype. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm a I'm a you know blonde boy. I was diagnosed as a child. I you know I was in my own world. I I was, I was in my own world too. Yeah, I was considered you know, gifted with my, you know, piano skills and perfect pitch as a child. A lot of me people too. called me a prodigy so as a I. child. So I fit that stereotype. Another reason why I stayed back is because I think we're headed in a better direction. For example, How to Dance in Ohio. Um, there is another series I watched just recently. It was a, a British series. Heartbreak uh, High, the character I mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, no, there, there, there are some great stuff out there. Uh, my personal favorite, Disney Pixar's Loop. I think you yes. I think you would really enjoy it because it features a non-speaking character and it's played by a non-speaking person. Oh, yeah. You should definitely check it out. Do you yeah. think it's offensive when someone who is neurotypical plays a character that is autistic? Yes. Hmm. That was one thing I was trying to bring up, especially where Veronica was bringing up about the more inclusive, basically inclusive appropriation. I do feel like it's so offensive with someone that's neurotypical to portray someone that's autistic. Like Sia did that with um, with a little girl who was of not on the spectrum and she had a lot of backlash for that. And I see what they're trying to do, but they don't think about why not someone that can understand it, especially for the fact this is something that's not temporary. This is permanent. Something that's kind of important is that in the media, a lot we see characters with autism, their entire character development is either learning to cope with autism or learning to mask autism. Uh, and it's not often something where it's like yourself, where it's like you, uh, your story is learning music, right? And becoming a teacher. And that's such a more wholesome story than a person <laughs> who's basically uh, learning to suppress themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just gonna, I think the reason why I have such a pushback against the good doctor and atypical is because being, I've, I went to drama school, I've surrounded myself with industry professionals who are not autistic. I know the intent and I just, in my opinion, they're doing it for money. I'm sorry, I just, I'm sorry. I just, it's selfish, it's greedy. And no matter, even if, some, even if they think they're doing the, the right thing, because they're relying most of the time on stereotypes, they're, push, they're continuing to push the narrative that we are not um, just one monolith. And for me, that really bothers me. And in no way am I shaped or form no, trying no, to like No, no, and I totally downplay. agree with that too. I, 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 I think it's better that I just, people I on just the get, spectrum. Yeah. I just be, get angry That could be said it. for anything though. Yeah. It's like, I think, I think when like, 
I feel the same way about like LGBTQ films exactly. with straight guys who try to like pander and be all, you know, clearly, you know, they're playing gay characters to win an Oscar. I mean, I look, I think of Saltburn. Yeah. yeah, gay for pay. Yeah. I think media as a whole is superficial. 90% of the time, there's like some deep movies, deep shows, things like that. But the reason why they only deal with how they deal with their autism or where they got their autism from and not something deeper like your story is because they don't tell those stories. They just tell you the quickest thing they could tell you. That's why I was so honored to be on American Idol. I, I, I am very, very happy with how they portrayed me. Uh, they even included my meltdown in there as well. It was, it was very raw and they didn't skew it. I, I can truly say that, you know, so. I'm, I th that's another reason why I say I think we're headed in the direct, right direction because I'm a first-hand lived example of that. Last point. And then you, you were talking about how, oh, LGBTQ films or actors of different races, and there's not that much happening with actors without autism um, representing characters with autism. Mm -hmm. that's, there, that's just because there's not enough movies being made about that. Like you saw Sia's music, and there was tons of backlash against that. But there hasn't been that much ba backlash in recent films because there just aren't enough films being which made. Which is ironic because Sia actually came out last year and said that she was di she had diagnosed with autism, which yeah. is a whole other ballgame that intrigues me. Yeah. But anyway, I just, I, I had to throw that out there. A lot of writing prompts there. <laughs> Let's move on to the next prompt. All right. It's better for autistic people to date within the community. You know what? <laughs> you know what? I might, I might just pop a squat. <laughs> you hesitated. I'm curious if you want to start. I hesitated because I, that's such a superficial thing to look, I mean, like, and just, and the basis of it. Like, I don't want to just be with somebody just because they're autistic, but, you know, it's, it's good to find commonality in someone. And I think autism is a huge part of my identity and how I see the, and how we see the world and just, like, I personally don't look for, I mean, granted, I've never been in a relationship and I think me being autistic and not trusting guys in particular is something that I struggle with, but I can see how it is better because it's easy just to, because that autistic person might be able to, like, see you like like at just even sitting here just talking about our experiences like you can say something and I can see you in that moment and it feels good but ultimately I don't think it's the end all be all so Abby you want to talk about dating David who's on the spectrum David my boyfriend is also on the autism spectrum and we like to go tra go go to like the Century City Mall independently sometimes and what's great about David that he understands the way my mind works he understands my autism and we just went to the zoo yesterday. <laughs> For her autism, dating someone within the autism community is right. And David understands her autism. Just the other night, we had a big um, dinner in a restaurant, and there was a crying baby right next to our table. What did David do for you? He covered my ears, and in some ways that, that baby actually really liked me. When he was crying, <laughs> he was a lot, you know who he reminded me of? Curious George. Yes, we, <laughs> we, the little we, monkey. We, we, and his we, mother reminded me of the man with the yellow hat. I know. She's great with the analogies, right? But but what was great is that when she started to have a meltdown and a, and a you know, real anxiety attack because of that screaming baby, that auditory sound, they wouldn't change tables. We asked to change our table. The restaurant wouldn't do it. It's just one of those unfortunate scenes. Family was really nice. It was just unfortunate. David leaned over and covered her ears and let her experience that. And I'm not sure a typical person would get that or understand that or have patience for that. And that happens, by the way, a lot. Would you feel uncomfortable having a neurotypical person date, Abby? Um, candidly speaking, I guess I kind of would. Because the innocence, um, she needs an aide to help her, always. Uh, we're still learning life skills. I don't understand how a typical person might be able to have that level of patience. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I just think in general, um, and what I've witnessed between David and Abby is, is like literally makes me cry, tears of joy. It's the most beautiful thing ever. I've never been in a relationship either, and I 100% am would love to date someone else on the spectrum. I, I definitely think that there would be a lot of beautiful connection there. However, there really is something beautiful about a neurotypical person who just gives a crap. I'm personally no less attracted to uh, autistic people than I am to neurotypical people, uh, but, but man, I'd be lying if I said I did not want, I'd be lying if I said I did not only want to date someone on the spectrum. I actually do agree with what y'all was saying earlier. Like, I do see where y'all are coming from about 
having someone on the spectrum date with someone on the spectrum just would lead less, pro it will bring less problems, but it just depends on the person, I guess, because I know me, because I can relate with Ian, I just said I'm pansexual, and unfortunately some people who I had feelings for, I had to try and find many reasons not to have feelings for them, especially at work, because <laughs> they are, <laughs> because Story I, my wife. <laughs> I don't, yeah, no, because I just, I hate it, because it's, it's just weird and inappropriate for me. Oh. But anywho, and I just think people on a spectrum should be able to make a choice if it's safe to do so, because yeah. we are living in a garden of evil, and we do have, <laughs> we do have unfortunate people that will manipulate those of us, whether we still have our innocence or not. What about you? What's I, your dating life like? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm, kidding. I'm totally kidding. So I'm 16. <laughs> oh, there you, go. Um, you obviously should be aware that you know sometimes people will prey on those who they think they can manipulate, uh, even in neurotypical relationships. But at the same time, I don't think that anyone, kind of regardless of uh, who they are, should close themselves off to someone sto solely based on like a group that they're a part of or a stereotype, mm -hmm. right? That and I so agree with. That I, I think that we with. should treat everyone as individuals and look at as such. And so maybe we should be kind of open to uh, whatever comes our way. Exactly. L let me put it this way. The autism label should not be the reason why a, neur a neurotypical person would not want to date someone on the spectrum. The autism themselves, you know, y y you see what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's hard to explain, you know, like the label can't get in the ways. If, if someone is like, oh, by the way, I have autism, and then they just immediately walk away just because of that, you know, then I think that that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah. I think dating is probably a struggle for many people, and whether yes. it be neurotypical yeah. or no, autism. Yeah. That's, that's why I have respect problem. for you, especially yeah. for the fact you're a single mom, you taking two kids a full job. Like, I have total respect for you because my mom is in a similar boat. I completely have full respect for you, so I understand completely. <laughs> How did you go about, I guess, setting up that blind date? Is there like a way for maybe autistic people to be able to date easier? Is well, there such it's interesting systems? because she was on Love on the Spectrum, and so that was like a random thing that came from Australia to the U.S. And I'll be honest with you, even saying yes to doing that show, she didn't really know what it was, I didn't really know what it was, but then I saw Australia season one and it made me nervous because they were driving cars, college grads, they were going to Europe by themselves, and I was like, well, we don't have that, and there's a big expressive language issue, so I think you want, pardon the term, Asperger's in love. Mm -hmm. because these folks have a different skill set, and I didn't want her to be in over her head. She didn't care really one way or the other. So obviously it was a great thing we did, but I will say that the team, once they came over, was really they were really kind about it, and they let her kind of be her and do her thing. And yeah, that's the right, because I, I couldn't focus and sit still. I needed, my, right. I needed to be moving. During the interview. Yeah. yeah. You Anyways. made it through with flying colors. <laughs> Thank you. And, and flying colors means victoriously, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, you're, and you're doing it here now. Yeah. Yes. Autism can be a strength. <laughs> Had to think about that, huh? Hmm. I don't know. I don't want to say it's a, like, I know people say it's a superpower. I don't necessarily agree that it's a superpower. One of the reasons why, like, I write about autism appreciation with my son, um, and I haven't really told the story of the reason why, when my son was first showing signs of delay and we were getting him diagnosed, it's all I thought about was, like, it's the worst thing in the world. Terrible things are going to happen. Terrible things are going to happen. As I was worrying about it being the worst thing in the world, I had a heart attack, and it turns out I needed a quintuple bypass. So I had a quintuple bypass. I was 35. Um, I had... No idea. I had no health problems before that or anything. And I remember being in the hospital, and I didn't think about what he couldn't do. I didn't think about my worries. I just wanted to see him. I wanted to get my son back. And since that day, I've seen, I've tried to focus my entire life on positives, but especially when it comes to him, the positives that come with his autism. And the fact, as I said before, he's, he's true. He's honest. He's genuine. His soul is pure. The things that he does are for a good reason. And a lot of the things that I think sometimes I'm guilty of as somebody who's, you know, neurotypical, um, you know, selfish tendencies sometimes or conceit or arrogance, things like that. He doesn't have those things. And it's almost like the removal of those things are his strength. I actually agree. Like, like I see your point because I do think autism is a strength. As you said, being autistic, it's like you have like, I guess in my, my meaning, double the innocence versus 
how you would be when you're neurotypical because when I was in high school, <laughs> imagine all the crap I have to eavesdrop on and I'm just <laughs> like, yeah, I think I know how you're gonna be growing up. <laughs> but it's not all of them any anyways. But the whole point though is some of them do remind you the kind the times where those innocence is almost so valuable because you know you only want to have them once and sometimes depending on what you do you may get it partly and some days you may get it but not the same way like you used to so yes i'm a little personally i'm a little on the fence about the pure thing i was called pure a lot uh as a teenager I, I don't i don't i just i'm not totally sure how i feel about that but i totally understand what you're saying in every other way and for me it takes the form of Autism is my superpower. Autism is my strength. Autism is something I have. It's not something that I am. Um, that's my relationship with it. And I will accommodate your relationships with your autism. Autism is not always a strength though. Some of the most traumatic moments of my life have been sensory overloads, meltdowns uh, in public. So I think that that would be kind of ridiculous to call that a strength. Uh, but at the same time, autism is very much a strength in so many other ways. Um, for me, I ditto that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I will say I am slightly different in the sense of like, I identify as an autistic person rather than a person with autism because it's not something I need to otherize. I, for me, I understand why other people would kind of, I, they have, everyone has their right to their preference. In terms of it being a strength, I see it as a strength because frankly, I don't know who I would be without it. Because <laughs> for me, in terms of how to incorporate my autism to that, I use it as part of my arsenal. Not as like a crutch, but like just more as like, a, I can do this because I have this mixture of my autism and my upbringing and I kind of bring them two together because that's what I know. You can't simply look at autism as a deficit as opposed to a strength because that's basically saying part of who that person is, is a deficit. And, and that's not correct. And so it's better that we try and have this positive outlook on it instead of saying, hey, this person has a problem. It's, hey, this person is different. How can we help them or accept them? But see, in Abby's case, there is a deficit. And that's the difference. So that's why the spectrum and the language is confusing. Hmm. If you have to learn to talk, and you have to learn that the world is happening right here because some people come in so isolated, just shut down. And I wish that the industry would change the language so that those that have overcome deficit are honored and those that have just a difference are honored. Do you see why the language and the confusion and new diagnostic things, it's all sort of blurred lines until we get this clear. And, it's, it's, to me, the biggest problem. Hey, Abby, I want to ask you a question. What do you, what do you think your strengths are? My strengths are um, singing, um, swimming. I can see things before anyone else. I can remember things. I can hear things far away in the distance. Yeah, no, it's very, very important that we all acknowledge the fact that everybody, whether we're on the spectrum or not, has strengths and weaknesses, uh, things that make us uh, unique. Um, just because the weaknesses or deficits, if you will, might seem a bit more outlandish or might be things that um, an overwhelming majority of society does not struggle with doesn't mean that that, that unique struggle is any less valid. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that it's wonderful to get to talk to everyone. <laughs> and I'm really glad to be able to hear about all your experiences because I didn't know a lot of like the experiences that you guys have had. I'm really glad I was able to understand those and learn those too. So to conclude it, uh, I know you were recently on American Idol. Um, <laughs> yes. We would love to hear you sing. Oh, well, before I sing, before I sing. <laughs> um, go stream my brand new EP, Regroup. I've worked with some absolutely incredible people, including my drummer, Logan Shepard. Shout out to you, man, who is also on the spectrum and is a touring drummer. It, anything is possible. And uh, you are the best that will never be oh in God. my life, in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what about me? No, uh, your turn, yes. I have, you know, Taylor Swift, the singer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, she's great. She's amazing. Um, I have this thing where I get older, but just never wiser. Midnights become my afternoons. <laughs> if you guys want to hug, shake it out. Yeah. 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 I have Everybody. a 
Her mother used to be a singer. Her mother used to be a singer. How's my singing voice? Oh, you you sound great, Abby. How's my singing voice? Hey! Whatever you want. Oh, totally. Yeah, high vlog on that. Yeah.